for more than 20 years on building capacity, governance, and fundraising. She is the founder of Sokio Heritage, an organization created to preserve the history, language, and traditional environmental knowledge of prairie peoples. Uh, Rosslyn serves as a member on the National Environmental Justice Advisory Council for the Environmental Protection Agency, something I'd love to hear you talk about on another night. Uh, and she's a faculty member in UM's Environmental uh, Studies Department here on campus, and she teaches some really great classes that you should check out. Um, so our other speaker is Jermaine White. Uh, Jermaine is the Information and Education Specialist for the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes uh, Division of Fish, Wildlife, Recreation, and Conservation. Jermaine currently develops informational and educational materials on resource management and conservation uh, issues for dissemination through printed materials uh, and uh, a wide variety of media. She does some really incredible work. And check out what, the, what she has done uh, on bull trout and fire uh, in the, uh, on the reservation up there. It's just really wonderful work that she's, that she's done with a, a former uh, Wilderness Institute um, uh, person. Uh, additionally, she develops and maintains working relationships with local civic organizations and schools to establish and implement environmental education programs. Uh, formerly, Jermaine served as Cultural Resources Program Manager for the Salish Pendle Culture Committee. Um, Jermaine received her Master's of Education from MSU, uh, but we'll forgive her for that because she got her BA from UN. So uh, everything is good. Thanks for coming tonight and, and Jermaine, take it away. Thanks so much. Um, first, let me thank Zach and Natalie for inviting me to be here tonight. I'd also like to, um, before I begin, I'd like to thank David Rockwell, first wilderness manager, uh, Herschel Mays, first tribal wilderness manager, Tom McDonald, longtime wilderness manager, and also Les Big Crane, current uh, wilderness manager. These people have done remarkable work in 
um, maintaining Mission Mountains Tribal Wilderness, and I'm grateful to them because I've borrowed heavily from their recollections and writings. So thank you, uh, thank you all. I'd like, I'd like to also thank Rosalind for being here tonight, and um, I'm looking forward to her comments as well. So I'm going to talk first of all about the a little bit about the history of development of Mission Mountains Tribal Wilderness, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the unique attributes of the wilderness. Um, so the Mission Mountains Tribal Wilderness on the Flathead Indian Reservation crowns a wilderness range that's unique not just in the management but also in its magnificence. Um, it rises some 7,000 vertical feet above the valley floor and um, uh, it's, it's the western range and it's one of the most uh, spectacular views uh, on the, uh, in the area. <laughs> okay, what the, okay, there we go. So the, here, here are the managers. Um, one of the incredibly unique attributes about the, about the wilderness is that it is the first tribal wilderness in the nation that, that was um, ever established. The tribe set aside approximately what was then uh, a quarter uh, of our land base for the establishment of wilderness forever. Um, that happened in 1979. But the wilderness, <laughs> okay. Um, but for the tribes and for champions of, of wilderness um, all across the nation and for, um, for wilderness protectors who are yet to come, the tribal wilderness is profoundly different from, from federal wilderness, and I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, the very concept of, of federal wilderness oftentimes is a wild, uh, separate place. Um, it's, it's the wild other. But for tribal people, this is really no different than any other land. Um, tribal wilderness is maybe a little more rugged. It, um, maybe there are times that weather prohibits access to it but it is clearly uh, a profoundly important, of our, important part of our landscape and is, um, is a place that's uh, known intimately and um, certainly used by tribal people. So the Salish, Ponderé, and Kootenai people um, uh, highly value the, the wilderness as, as an important part of our tribal homeland. As I said, it's, it's uh, incredibly rugged, there's extreme weather, but it's not separate from the rest of our homeland. It's a place that for millennia we have used to gather food and medicinal plants. We hunt there, we camp there. It's, it's a place that uh, some people say um, is known as intimately as the, um, the, the curves of the hills and the lines of the trail are known as intimately as the curves and the lines of their mother's faces. So this is a landscape that is profoundly important, not just for recreation, but also for cultural and, and spiritual purposes as well. Um, it's, it's important that we establish this wilderness because uh, it's, a, it's a place where we're able to maintain and, and sustain uh, parts of our tribal way of life that require a particular reciprocal relationship. Um, this was the way that people interacted with, with the wilderness, with this area for, uh, for tens of thousands of years. But the marginalization of that uh, traditional way of life began rapidly and dramatically with the um, opening of the reservation. Uh, first of all, the allotment of, of tribal land, the dividing of, of lands, and then the opening of land uh, to homes to homesteads, so it, it really um, changed that communal way of life that people had lived for a profoundly, a, a profoundly long time. It ushered in a, a very complicated political landscape, and um, it, it provided a whole different political system. We went from uh, traditional leadership where, uh, where people were um, 
were sought out by elders and asked to bear the burden of responsibility of leadership to an elected tribal council. Um, and that happened, um, we were the first tribes to um, reconstitute, to, to develop a, a tribal constitution with the Indian Reorganization Act. And the first attempt that the tribes made to establish a wilderness area was in 1936 with a, um, with a letter that was sent to um, to the Commissioner of Indian Affairs. It, it was also a time during the CCC's or uh, Civilian Conservation Civilian Conservation Corps um, when tri when tribal people were uh, reestablishing um, trails in the wilderness. But um, a letter was sent to the Commissioner of Indian Affairs. Um, I understand that that nothing happened there. It, it kind of died. But interestingly enough, and ironically, a year later, the Office of Indian Affairs proposed a roadless area in the Mission, Mission Mountains. The tribes rejected it because they had no input in, in the development of, of this roadless area, and um, they had provided their consent. So it was then um, the Mission Range roadless area was declassified in the Federal Register in 1959. During the mid-1970s, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, uh, who managed uh, tribal resources in trust for, uh, for the tribes, proposed a number of, of logging sales. And these were huge logging sales. Um, the, the, they proposed logging the front of, of the missions. And at that point, the tribes were, um, were began to push back significantly. Um, the, the proposal followed multiple, multiple large-scale logging units uh, across the reservation. Um, in 1974, there were 30 logging units reported in the February 1975 issue of the Charcousta News, the, the tribal newspaper. Um, it was astonishing. There, there was uh, these logging units included Valley Creek at 83.1 million board feet. Granjo unit at 77.2 million board feet. This was all in one year. They were proposing these. Uh, Boulder logging unit at 51.8 million board feet and Reve at 40 million board feet. And more than 50% of the timber they were proposing to log was vir virgin timber on the reservation. So that's a bit of the backdrop that was happening at the time when, um, when the Ashley logging unit was was proposed, and the Ashley unit really fueled. Um, <laughs> okay, do you say pretty please? Oh, thank you. Um, so, um, in 1979, the council decided to set aside the the tribal council, the governing, the political governing body of the tribes, decided to set aside 91,778 acres for wilderness forever. Um, and this was a decision that came about um, by lots of people. There were, there were lots of people and lots of organizations that, that had influence in, in this decision. But there, there was one group that I want to talk about a little bit. Um, there were three grandmothers, three yayas um, on the reservation, and they were very concerned about the proposed logging on, on the face of the missions. And they added their support with other community leaders. And, and this was really, um, really important. There were, there were a group of community people that began the Save the Missions Committee. Um, the committee circulated a petition in 1975 requiring the council to, uh, to designate a, a wilderness area, a, a primitive area in which logging would be banned. Um, soon after that, the the tribal council began seriously considering some kind of some kind of wilderness, but the role of these three grandmothers is, I think, interesting and unique, and um, it's an example of how the political process differs from um, the non-tribal uh, the non-tribal political process. It it tells about how these yayas um, provided a, a cultural imperative for the establishment of the Mission Mountains and really supported. These group, this group of uh, community people that that were circulating a petition. So, um, the Save the Missions Committee learned that the Tribal Council was passing 
resolution 4650 approving the Ashley logging unit, which was right smack dab in the, on the face of the missions, um, just a little bit north of, of San Ignatius, a, a, you know, a stunningly beautiful landscape. Um, they were proposing this on August 9th of 1975. Um, so I, borrowed a, a friend's suburban. I went to the home of Christine Woodcock, uh, Louise McDonald, and Annie Pierre, the three Yayas, and asked them if they, and asked them if they would come with me to meet with the tribal council and, and visit with them about their ideas ab about the wilderness. And um, on the way there, we talked about the proposed timber sales and what was happening with, with logging. And we arrived in, in Dixon at the tribal agency, and um, the tribal council, these, these 10 leaders um, stopped business. Um, it, it was rare that these three grandmothers showed up together in, in one place unless it was an important cultural, uh, cultural event or an important uh, family event for, for the Woodcock or uh, the Finley families. Um, so the councilman greeted them with deference and respect and asked how they could help them um, and one by one, each of the wo women spoke at length about, uh, about the missions. They, they talked about this cultural trust that we had for, that we had inherited this cultural magnificence, and it was our responsibility to preserve it for all future generations. Um, they, they talked about our, um, our responsibility to maintain our traditional way of life. Um, they, they talked about the values of the natural world that have nourished us from the very beginning of time. Um, and when they finished, everything was silent. And um, the tribal councilman paused for a moment and then thanked them very much. And they remained seated. And the council said, is there anything else we can do? And the ayahs sat there and they said, well, we'll just wait until you take a vote. So um, at that point, the tribal council voted to go back to a much simpler, uh, a very small test project and abandon this large scale clear cut logging on the, on the face of the missions. Um, so the, the Save the Missions proposed a boundary that was at the, at the base of the missions and it, it included roads and it included uh, non-tribal lands and it was really an untenable uh, proposition. Um, they, they really, um, you know, the IAS did not want large scale clear cuts. They were really interested in preserving the integrity of, of the missions. Um, there were uh, several proposals that were advanced but they all really lacked um, management considerations and and um, uh, other than they just wanted to, to prohibit logging. So in 1976, um, at recommendations of Thurman Trosper, who was a tribal member who um, was in the Washington office of the National Forest Service, he, he was also um, chair of the National um, Wilderness Society. Um, he, he was um, very interested in um, in a wilderness area. What, what he said to me was that the Mission Mountains are as beautiful as any, any area, as beautiful as Glacier, as beautiful as anywhere else in, in this area, and we should establish a wilderness. So um, the Tribal Council um, contracted with the Wilderness Institute here at the university to um, develop a, a draft boundary and management proposal for a Mission Mountains tribal wilderness area. Um, two years later, a, a draft was presented to the Tribal Council. The, the Council took no immediate action upon receiving the draft, um, but um, they wanted to look at, um, at all of at all of the information and consider it, consider it carefully. So um, the Tribal Council decided a year later then to, then to create um, the Tribal Wildland Recreation Program. And that was a program um, that had the responsibility for, for managing 
the wilderness and maintaining the specific values of the tribe for, for wilderness. Um, the, uh, the wildland recreation program um, was tasked with um, developing a management plan and in the spring of 1982, um, um, ordinance <laughs> Thank you. Are you helping me with that? Oh, okay. I'll, I'll just raise my hand or something to give you the high five. I, I'm, I'm not sure what I'm not doing there. Anyway, um, the Tribal Council approved Ordinance 79A, the Tribal Wilderness Ordinance, and the Mission Mountains Tribal Wilderness Management Plan. And this action was historic. This was, um, again, as I said, it was the first time that a tribe had ever set aside tribal land in, in the establishment of, of a wilderness. Uh, the first section of the Tribal Wilderness Ordinance states that wilderness has played a paramount role in shaping the character of the people and the culture of the Salish and Kootenai tribes. It is the essence of traditional Indian religion and has served the Indian people and the culture of the Salish and Kootenai tribes as a place to hunt, as a place to gather medicinal herbs and roots as a spiritual use area, as a sanctuary, and in countless other ways for thousands of years. Because maintaining an enduring resource of wilderness is vitally important to the people of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes and the perpetuation of our culture, there is hereby established a Mission Mountains Tribal Wilderness Area. And this area, described herein, shall be administered to protect and preserve wilderness values. So there are some unique attributes about the Mission Mountains Tribal Wilderness. Um, in June of 1981, the tribes continued the historic pres precedent by establishing um, the Mission Mountains Grizzly Bear Management Area. And this is 10,000 area, 10,000 acres within the, within the wilderness that's set aside. Um, it's, it's closed from July 15th to October 1 to ensure that grizzly bears have um, access to adequate resources it, and to avoid um, human-bear conflict. So it was the first time that anyone had, had closed an area specifically for bears. Um, and I think that the cultural nexus between the tribes and grizzly bear is often, and, and the importance of that in establishing the Mission Mountains Tribal Wilderness is oftentimes misunderstood um, and underestimated. This was a profoundly important component of of the establishment of the Mission Mountains Tribal Wilderness. Um, it, it, this, was, this happened largely at the urging of um, a Kootenai cultural advisor named Pat Lefthand, who said that, that bears were not our food. We never hunted them. They, they were the leader of the animals, and we had a responsibility to respect them and care for them. Um, the Mission Mountains Tribal Wilderness Fire Management Plan is also unique in that it provides um, uh, opportunities for, for wildland fire to change the uh, natural mosaic within, um, within the wilderness. Um, but Indian use of fire um, was profoundly important in that it, it helped shape and maintain it was one of the most powerful tools that tribes used to shape and maintain this landscape. This is really a fire-adapted landscape, so it's important that we include fire in, um, uh, in the Mission Mountains Tribal Wilderness. One of the other unique attributes of the Mission Mountains Tribal Wilderness is that we created a buffer zone. And in 1986, the tribe set aside approximately 23,000 acres um, at the at the foothills of, of the Mission Mountains. And it is just that, it's a buffer zone. It's meant to buffer all of the development, all of the roads, all of the activities of the valley floor from the wilderness to help maintain that, um, the wilderness values. Um, the overall goal of the buffer zone is to protect and preserve the integrity of the tribal wilderness. So, okay, is that, yeah. The last slide, yeah, of the acres. Um, so Tom McDonald, former 
Mission Mountains Tribal Wilderness Manager stated, wilderness is, to a segment of the tribal population, vitally important. It's one part of Indian culture that remains today as it has always been. Management and maintenance of the wilderness expresses reverence for the land and its community of life, as well as respect for Indian culture. So the Mission Mountains Tribal Wilderness, the buffer zone, the fire management plan, and, um, and the grizzly bear closure are all unique attributes of the Mission Mountains Tribal Wilderness. I, I, I think that um, they're a way that allow us to help maintain our culture, uh, our traditions, uh, our, uh, a way of life that uh, has been handed to us from our elders and our ancestors. Um, tribal people have relied on the natural world and, uh, and I think that it's, it's profoundly important that we maintain the plant and animal communities, particularly in areas like the Mission Mountains Tribal Wilderness. Thank you. Yes? Oh, I am on. Okay. There you go. I can hear myself. Okay. Good evening. <laughs> I'm going to show up at some point here, I think. Okay, so you can go to the first slide. So I was asked to uh, address a few questions tonight. Uh, one was to uh, speak a little bit about the Badger to Medicine area on the other side of the mountain uh, and Glacier National Park and also just in general to speak about uh, Blackfeet views of wilderness in general so, and the future. Maybe that's for everyone else to discuss. Okay, go ahead. Uh, oh, you can go ahead. Sorry. So one of the things you should recognize at the very beginning is that the Blackfeet, one of the words that they always called themselves was the Sokiotapi, which is the prairie people. So uh, this is important to recognize and to acknowledge because they saw themselves as people of the prairies. And the mountain areas, and there were several different um, mountain ranges and mountain areas within their territory, was something that was sort of a, uh, not the core part of where they lived, but was on the periphery. That doesn't mean that it was less important, but it was not the core of where their um, cultural uh, heritage came from. So I'm going to provide some very basic sort of historic information about um, the history of the creation of Glacier Park and the Badger Two Medicine, just to kind of give you an idea of uh, how those came not to be part of Blackfeet territory anymore. But so, as you can tell, this is a map of Montana. The two parts of Montana that I've highlighted here are a place, Rocky Mountains, and over here you can't quite tell, but it's an area called the Little Rockies. I did not have a photo for that, but I'll mention that in a minute, so go ahead. So in uh, 1895, George Bird Grinnell, who of course is seen as one of the fathers of American environmentalism, um, he brokered two agreements um, with two different tribal groups. Uh, he brokered an agreement with the Blackfeet tribe uh, on the western part of Montana, and he brokered an agreement with the Assiniboine and the Grovan tribe in the Little Rockies. And, go ahead. So in the Rockies, the agreement with the Blackfeet was signed in um, 1885, and after 1886, uh, that particular area, which I'll show you a map in just a minute, was um, created into a place that was called the Mineral Strip. And uh, what occurred then in both of these agreements that happened was there was a search for gold in both areas, and that's why the agreements occurred. So in both of those areas, tribe, the tribal communities lost property and lost their land in this effort to look for gold. And, go ahead. Sorry. In the Little Rockies, which is, again, kind of in the middle of uh, the state of Montana, in the Little Rockies, unfortunately, they found gold. 
So it, they had found gold actually probably in, sometime during the 1880s, probably earlier than that. Uh, gold was discovered there. And over the years, from the 1880s to the present, there has been gold mining in the Little Rockies. Uh, in the 1970s and 1980s, they started a very unique process of gold um, extraction called cyanide leach mining. And because of that, uh, if you Google the Zortman Landusky mine, you'll find out that now that there's basically permanent environmental damage to that area because of the cyanide leach mining, and it's something that now the state of Montana has outlawed. But because of that, the Little Rockies now basically suffer permanent environmental contamination because of cyanide. That's all a result of George Bird Grinnell's original agreement in search of gold. Kind of the exact opposite history happened to the Rockies. So same time period, same people, basically the same exact agreement. Um, but what happens in the Rockies is even though there's an, a search for gold and other minerals, they really don't find anything. So go ahead. So this is not the best map, but hopefully I can. So here's, I'm going to show you where the, it was called the mineral strip. So there's one line that goes down. So that's now the current boundary with the Blackfeet Reservation. And then the other line is kind of here. You kind of see it. So this area here is what George Bird Grinnell negotiated with the Blackfeet tribe um, for, the Black to, for the Blackfeet tribe to sell to the United States government. Again, in this effort to search for uh, mostly gold, silver, and other minerals. So this was originally called um, the Mineral Strip, or it was also called the Mineral Belt. And again, people went, and within a year of them signing this agreement, there were over 500 miners who had already signed up and, um, and uh, started mining in this area. And within maybe 10 years, there was a town uh, outside of many glaciers. So for those of you who are know the area, uh, that had um, over 2,000 people that lived there um, as permanent residents who were searching for um, gold and minerals in this area. But again, uh, they didn't really find anything. So then the question becomes, what do you, now what do you do with this land? This land changed, after it changed hands, it became part of uh, the National Forest Service, although it didn't exactly exist then, National Forest Service territory. So it became part of the federal government's management. One of the things that um, was happening at this time, this was the very last sort of, so the Blackfeet tribe had lost land every 10 years from 1855 all the way to 1895. And this was the last bit of sort of what we would consider quote unquote wilderness land um, that, the, that the Blackfeet had and that they were using. So, go ahead. So, go ahead. All right. So the mineral strip then becomes, um, sorry, I'm going to make you go backwards to the map really quick. So the mineral strip is going to become two different pieces of land. So it's going to be cut around uh, here, I think. Of course, I can't quite tell. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Okay, right around there. So. Everything north of that is going to become Glacier Park. Everything south of that becomes National Forest Service land. So, go ahead. so this happens in 1910. So in 1910, Glacier National Park gets created. And after that, Glacier National Park then follows um, National Park Service rules. And because of that, there are a lot of restrictions. As you know, if you go into any national park, there are a lot of restrictions on human, human use. And after that happened, the Blackfeet tribe was basically told that once it became National Park Servi Service land, no longer part of Forest Service, that there were totally different rules and the Blackfeet tribe was going to have to follow them. This is something that's been a point of contention ever since 1910 about what kind of use um, the Blackfeet tribe can have with this territory. So, go ahead. The Badger to Medicine land, which is sort of the southern part of that mineral strip, has a lot of different federal uh, management 
uh, over that, that territory. It's under two different main um, and different federal agencies. One is the Department of Agriculture, the other is the Department of Interior. Uh, sometimes speak with each other, sometimes don't. Uh, and then it also has a lot of other sort of um, people who've been involved with attempting to manage that piece of land. So over the years, and I'm sure there's people in this, in this audience who know the story uh, as well, or maybe even better than I, over the years there's been an attempt to sort of manage and control, limit human use within this area. Uh, partly because the Blackfeet tribe has asked for that. The Blackfeet tribe ha has not had to ask for that with Glacier Park because Glacier Park follows under different rules. So we don't have to ask for the federal government to have it as a protected area. Badger to Medicine, um, again, over the years, has become a little more protected and more protected in terms of human use. There are still, uh, at this point, a third of the Badger II medicine has one particular rules and two thirds are under different rules because of what is considered eligible versus not eligible for the National Register. So about two thirds of, the, of that land is considered part of the eligible, it's not part of, eligible for National Register um, uh, status. And because of that, it follows sort of different rules again. So I'm not going to kind of go into that. Uh, but just to say that there's a different, um, different ways of managing land once it reaches that status. So go ahead. So one of the questions for this evening that I was asked to talk about was the idea of wilderness, and sort of what was is there a sort of a different idea uh, for Blackfeet in terms of wilderness, and in particular that particular area, those sort of mountainous areas that are right to the west of the Blackfeet Reservation. So this is a picture, old, old picture. Let me see if I can, that's me in the middle. And we are actually uh, right near Badger Canyon. So when I was growing up, we spent a lot of time um, in the Badger Canyon area, because my family has property there, and also in an area called Little Badger, because my family has property there as well. Um, and so one of the questions is, is do the black bee consider this wilderness? And I'm assuming uh, that you guys meant kind of the American definition of wilderness, yes? Um, so go ahead. And uh, the answer is, yeah, not so much. <laughs> so the black bee definitely have a different definition of sort of, I guess, what you would say is empty space, maybe, right? Unused, unused space. Um, so the Blackfeet, for the most part, when they think of what Americans would define as wilderness space, um, as Jermaine has pointed out really well, most Native people would think of it as, as used space. It's space that's it's really well used in a lot of different ways. Um, in this particular case, this is recreation. You know, we were there recreating. Uh, but when I was growing up, our family used it for a lot of different reasons. Um, some religious, some recreation, some utilitarian. Um, so, go ahead. so one of the things I wanted to point out this evening is sort of the Blackfeet idea or Blackfeet concept of multiple use. Right? And in particular, these two land areas that, that um, were part of the reservation and are now no longer part of the reservation. So go ahead. So one of the, one of the uh, definitions that the Blackfeet tribe would say is that there are certain places that are sacred and they are not used. People don't go near them, they are left alone, and they are seen as separate space from humans because, for the most part, because there is a supernatural entity that lives there, right? And either lives there now as a sort of living entity, or sometimes a supernatural entity retires there. So they've kind of lived their life. They've kind of done, you know, gone on, the, gone on their epic journey, and they're, you know, kind of deciding to live their retirement life, and they go and they move to a specific place. So that's one kind of definition of sort of the separateness 
part of, I guess I'd say, wilderness definition um, is that, and so in Glacier Park, there are definitely several places that would fall under this first definition, that you don't go there because somebody lives there, right? And as well in the Badger to Medicine. There are places like that that kind of follow under that first definition. The second one is kind of the same, only different, which is there are sacred places that you can go to, um, but the expectation is you're not going to stay there. So you're not going to live there, you're not going to move there. Um, it's a place, sometimes it's sacred because it's near a place where somebody lives. So there are a lot of places now in Glacier Park where people go for prayer, contemplation, vision quests, and the reason why those are important places, the reasons why you would go there for prayer is because it is in proximity to a place where there's a supernatural entity. So the supernatural entity is not living here, supernatural entity is living over here, but you go over here to pray because it's in proximity. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's sort of another sort of definition and, and um, those places can be pointed out on a map, both of those. The third one, and Jermaine also mentioned this one too, um, that there are specific places that people would go to look for plants, animals, objects. By objects, I mean things like paint. You know, if you're using paint in a, for ceremonial purposes, if you're looking for pipe stone, there are places in the Badger Two Medicine where people went specifically to look for pipestone to make pipes. Um, if you're looking for any of kind of the materials that you would use in ceremonies or rituals, uh, there are specific places that people go to to fi find those specific things. And again, those are considered sort of important, significant, uh, some people would say sacred places. Um, but again, there's not a supernatural that lives there. It's not a place where you go pray, but it's an actually just a specific place where you go look for those things that you need for, um, for ritual and for ceremony. So that kind of, those three top ones kind of cover, you know, the kind of sacred space that you would find uh, in quote unquote kind of an unused area or wilderness type area. And then the other one is kind of the obvious you know, a very obvious one, which is sort of utilitarian uses. You know, the Blackfeet used a lot of places for hunting, for gathering, for collecting materials, and they left a lot of those places alone so that they could be places where there would be abundance, right? One of the things that Germain had talked about was the um, grizzly bear, although the Blackfeet also didn't hunt grizzly bear, but there were places where they were left alone so that the animals could flourish there and live, and then you could go hunt them, or the plant life could flourish and live, and then you could go collect it. So those places were left for those particular purposes. And again, it's not an unused space, it's a used space, even though someone's not physically there. So, And then the last thing that people used these particular areas for, these mountainous areas, is for, you know, there was a lot of roads, there was a lot of transportation routes um, that existed within those areas. So there are, there is documentation to show that there uh, was temporary habitation in a lot of these places. You know, people did camp and they spent time there, but there was not any sort of permanent um, villages or permanent uh, use areas. So all of this like Jermaine had mentioned earlier, I mean, all of these places are known places. There were, it was extremely rare when there was a place on the landscape that the Blackfeet didn't have uh, the, a use for that particular place. There were no sort of empty places, unused, untouched. Um, there were a lot of places that were used and touched for all of these different reasons. So kind of a different idea of sort of what wilderness exactly means. So. Go ahead. I think I'm. And for what the future holds, we'll see. So, thank you.
don't have a mic tonight to pass around, so I'll just ask Jermaine and Rosalind to repeat the questions so that everyone can hear the questions from folks. Uh, <coughs> question, Jermaine, you talked a lot about the cultural values of the uh, tribal wilderness. Uh, and I'm, I'm wondering how those cultural values get transferred down generation to generation. If, if it happens in any sort of formal way, maybe in school, or just word of mouth from parents to kids to grandkids, that sort of thing. Great question, and I want to thank Rosalind for providing a lot of detail to some of the abstract concepts that that um, that I talked about. But the transmission of that oral history information about the values for the Mission Mountains tribal wilderness and and wilderness areas in particular, and it's funny to call them wilderness because they're really not considered to be wild. These, as as both Rosalind and I have said. These are areas that are known and that are profoundly important. And, um, you know, I, we take our kids there, um, and as our parents took us there. And what I believe is that young people don't come to know and love wilderness until um, they understand it for themselves. And I don't want kids to take my word for it. I, I don't want to, you know, tell my kids, you know, gosh. When I was a kid growing up, I spent a lot of time um, hiking and fishing with my dad and spent a lot of time in the wilderness. It's, it's really great. I, I mean, I, I think that they'll really come to understand it and love it for themselves when they have that personal experience. So um, I, I think it's, it's part of the way that we um, transfer information from one generation to another is by, um, by having that experiential um, knowledge transfer from generation to generation. It's, it's out of recent. Then we take them. You know, we take, uh, I, um, I took my sister's kids. I, both of my sisters lived off the reservation at some point in their lives, and I just had my nephews for the summer, and I took them. So, you know, it's, it's a responsibility that we bear as as family members. We also bear it as a community. We have a wildland recreation program and every summer we have a trail crew that's made up of, um, of young high school kids that come and work with us and they spend all summer in the wilderness building, building trails. So um, they come to know it firsthand by having that experience. Supernatural number one category of Jumbo. Do, do the someone and the tribe know that that spirit of being is still there? Is that spirit of being ever leave and do one thing? Or how is there is there ever a new place? I mean, I'm just curious, like, are there so many? Uh, you know, the ones I've passed, but then how do they keep track of these places? That's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the question was uh, in terms of category number one. In, uh, of, of sacred places where there's a supernatural entity that lives there, uh, sort of do they remain the same or are there new places created? Uh, and the question, the answer to that is it's a little complicated. Uh, there was a time when there were always kind of new places being created. Uh, for the most part, I would say most people would say that many of the places now have been uh, created for many years, and so they're known places. I think the first part of your question is, how did, how did people know? They don't have really like massive people seem to uh, just pass on through generations where they are. So one of the ways that you know that is through place names. So a lot of Blackfeet place names, as part of the place name, is the uh, story that goes along with it, and usually within the story it tells the story of that uh, the people or person who lives there, or or entity. Um, sometimes there's um, people. Sometimes there's animals. Sometimes there's monsters. Uh, so, in the place name, um, you would find you would know that information. And some of the places are very commonly known. Some not so much. 
but it's something that um, is passed on orally. So for example, uh, when I was growing up, and I think this was pretty true for any Blackfeet child, when we would drive from Browning, say to Great Falls to go shopping, um, if you were with an older person, they would tell you the story of every nook and cranny as you drove along, and you would do that trip you know, a hundred times, and you would get told the same exact story over and over and over again of, well, this is the place that this happened, and this is the place that this happened, and this is, and so um, it almost, you know, so you, how can you not remember all of those places? And I do the same thing now with my children, you know, we'll go someplace, and I'm like, well, this is the place that, you know, so that's, I mean, that's sort of how that information gets passed on. Yes. Uh, with the Eloise Cobalt settlement, but Jenny thought with the tribal councils to acquire other areas that um, maybe were lost previously and add to the wilderness? So the question is with the Cabell settlement, are there, um, will tribal councils um, use those funds to acquire lands that have been lost from tribal ownership? Um, our reservation is, is different from, uh, from Blackfeet. And I talked a little bit about the profound and dramatic changes that happened. There were a group of Missoula businessmen that were very keen to have access to the rich timber resources and other resources on Flathead Indian Reservation. It was right in their backyard. So people like Higgins and Warden and all of the city fathers here, um, you know, lobbied um, a congressman um, named Joe Dixon to um, have access to those resources. And so our reservation was uh, allotted. So basically what happened was a, a survey was done of the reservation. This communal land base that the tribes had was broken into, uh, it, was, it was like checkers, you know, and, and chunks of land were handed out and people had no sense of what, what this was after living communally for forever. Anyway, so our reservation was, was um, divided into allotments and then the land that was not allotted was considered, was declared surplus and was open to homesteading. So um, between, oh, you know, I'm a woman of a certain age and so I'm terrible with numbers. Don't take this as, as absolute truth, but in, from, yeah, from, <laughs> thank you. Roslyn's great with numbers. <laughs> From 1910 to 1935, when the Indian Reorganization Act stopped that loss of land, over 400,000 acres of 1.3 million acre reservation was lost to tribal ownership. So in, in the 1990s, the Tribal Council was visionary, and what they did at that point was begin an aggressive land acquisition program. And so over the, those intervening years, the tribes set a priority for land acquisition. And we have been um, acquiring land um, within the reservation is our, our primary target area. But there are some sacred sites that are profoundly important to us that lie outside of the reservation boundaries. And those lands we have also targeted for acquisition as well. So uh, we're majority landowners on our reservation at, the, at this point. We're, um, you know, we've been, we're like, between 60 and 70 percent of the land is now owned by the tribe. We're beginning on the reservation first, and then we'll look at Aboriginal territory. Thank you. Great question. Yes. Yes, of course. Um, within the uh, wilderness boundary and within the boundary of the wilderness, how much of it was uh, allotment? How much of it was trusted? Did they have to actually convert it when they made uh, when they had the tribal acts to, to make? What, what was the land composition at the time of, uh, when of the land? creation of the, of the? Great question. So, what was the land status? What was the land ownership status of the lands within the within the area that became the 90, 91 point um, or ninety one thousand seven hundred and seventy eight? acres of Mission Mountains tribal wilderness. Um, the majority of it was tribal land. So those lands 
uh, that were kind of on the fringe, the mountain areas, were retained as, as communal tribal ownership. The valley floor was divided into checkers. Um, but within those lands, every, um, was it 16 and 32 uh, sections were set aside as school trust sections. We've, we've since, yeah, yeah, those sections were, were set aside. We have since traded those with the state, and so the lands within the wilderness are, are now all tribal lands, and that's a great question. And here is a wilderness case study, and it has a map of the wilderness in there. And I meant to thank people that you had the first question. Yeah, would you pass that? <laughs> Pass that down to him. And the, would you guys pass this up to the gentleman in the back that had, well, I'll do that, um, that had the question. Thanks so much. Uh, Mission Mountains Tribal Wilderness Case Study. <laughs> not, not that I'm lobbying for one of the <laughs> But uh, in 1956, when the Wilderness Act was first introduced, uh, it listed all these areas that were supposed to be designated as wilderness, not just in the Forest Service, but the Park Service, the Fish and Wildlife Service, and areas managed by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. It listed a whole bunch of reservations that were supposed to have wilderness. And I think we can appreciate that that was probably an inappropriate decision to be made by Congress and by the tribal lands that were to be made as wilderness. And my question is, can you can you uh, uh, explain to us why more tribal wilderness hasn't been created since then? I mean, here we have we have two examples. We have the, the Confederated Tribes decided we're going to have wilderness. The Blackfeet have not said we're going to designate a wilderness. Can you explain why? <laughs> So the question is, why haven't more tribes designated wilderness areas, since only one tribe has? And um, the answer to that question is, I don't know. <laughs> but I think par uh, part of the answer might be, I'll answer it anyway, part of the answer might be that, that land is very complicated on a lot of reservations, and, and there's a complicated history behind it, there's complicated land ownership, there's checkerboarding, so sometimes it is difficult to have one very large piece of land uh, to set aside and um, and trying to, I mean, I think that the uh, Sage and Kootenai were very fortunate that they did have a large enough area that they could set aside. Some reservations don't have large areas like that because of allotments and the checkerboarding that occurred and because of homesteading. Not all reservations were homesteaded. They were homesteaded and it was, it could have been a, a horrible disaster story, um, but they have slowly in the last hundred years kind of come back from the brink of, of homesteading. So, want to answer that too? Yeah, okay. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> You know, I, I mean, I, I, I really can't. I can't speak for other tribes. For us, maintenance of that cultural landscape was so profoundly important that, um, and, and, you know, it was sort of this, um, this synchronistic convergence of vectors, you know. All of these things came together, and uh, lots of groups, lots of people, and um, it, it was just profoundly important to maintain that for future generations. Yes. This is for Rosalind. Um, as, as you know, the uh, east portal of the Glacier National Park at St. Mary's has a wonderful visitor center. And in that center is a display that I think was so well done, largely because it quotes from the Blackfeet tribal leaders much of the same history you gave us for how the US government acquired that portion of the park east of the Continental Divide. And the message is not at all subtle, as reported by the tribal leadership, that they were hoodwinked. You know, it was acquired by betrayal, if not grand larceny. And 
I wonder if that's still the pervasive attitude of the Blackfeet Nation that really the National Park uh, is their territory east of the divide. So, uh, so the answer is yes and yes. <laughs> so yes, uh, the, I would say the majority of Blackfeet people do think they were, in your phrase, hoodwinked. Um, and, and the second part, that they uh, do think it is their territory. Yes, both. But you have to remember the history, which, again, it could, it could be a disaster. It could be the Little Rockies, right? Because it was not, um, the agreement was not to create a national park. The agreement was to create a mineral strip where they were going to do um, all-out uh, mining. So that was never the intention from the very beginning. The intention was never for uh, preservation. The intention was for mining. So that's part of the history as well. So. Why well, my favorite story is about the Kayat, about the grandmothers, and how. Thank you. So, the question was, do you have a favorite story you want to tell about about the wilderness, the Mission Mountains Tribal Wilderness? And I, I think I already told you my favorite story about the wilderness, and it's the story of the, the three grandmothers and the incredible cultural authority they had and, um, you know, their ability to look at these ten political leaders who had, you know, who every day made decisions about the well-being of the tribes and to just say, we're here to remind you what it is that's most important. And you cannot exchange short-term economic gain for a long-term cultural survival. And I, it was, um, they did it in, um, in such a beautiful, elo eloquent, and um, compassionate way. So it's, it's my favorite story. Take a look at us. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> Uh, I would say yes. So, there, so historically, yes, for sure. Um, contemporary, it depends. So there's always been um, sort of a balance between um, female and male participation in society, and it's always been very different. So in Blackfeet society, for example, um, historically, women always played a leadership role in religion, and men played a leadership role in politics. And that was sort of the way that things were balanced out in society. Um, that changed a little bit when Christianity was introduced onto the Blackfeet Reservation and the idea that men were leaders in religion and not women. And so there was, so there's still um, uh, both in 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 society. But in terms of, I would I would argue that the majority of people on the Blackfeet Reservation, possibly the Salish Kootenai, uh, the majority of the people who um, play um, leadership roles in a lot of the um, tribal um, organizations, nonprofit organizations are female, and um, who have um, higher education are female. So just as a follow-up to that, it, historically, um, among the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes, um, it, it was very egalitarian. And what, what people understood is that if, if there was a woman who was, um, who was an intuitive and fierce warrior, then clearly she was a, a leader in battle. If there was a man who understood that had extraordinary spatial intelligence and understood how to piece buffalo hides together to make a teepee, then, then that person would, would be a leader in that. So oftentimes, whatever your attributes were that provided for the well-being of the tribes, those were really encouraged by elders and, and leaders, and, and you were um, uh, sort of mentored. You had an apprenticeship relationship so that everyone everyone's strength was uh, came together to, uh, to be a strength within the tribe. So 
there, as, as Rosalind said, there was an incredible balance. Um, you know, there was not this sort of huge power differential that, that um, sometimes happens in the dominant culture. Uh, it, it was very different historically and traditionally. I'm wondering about any existing mining claims that might have a threat to either the protected area or the protected areas. You mentioned Roslyn, Little Rockies, and contamination of the desecrated little mountain, spirit, spirit, spirit mountain. And then you have uh, another part of the lost refuge, the Sweetgrass Hills, which was under a frontier moratorium for gold mining. I don't know if that's inspired by that, but um, does the, the tribe still have a, a best active interest in protection of the, of the sweet grass hills? Okay, yeah, so that it's, it's very complicated. So again, um, any kind of land issue in the West is always extremely complicated. The sweet grass hills are, you need to really look at a map to see all of the jurisdictions that exist in the Sweetgrass Hills, and there's multiple, multiple jurisdictions between federal government, state government, county government, um, local landowners. And so again, there's not one huge piece of land anywhere that is, belongs to any one group. Um, it's really checkerboarded there. So there, so there is a historic, um, uh, belief about the Sweetgrass Hills. There's four of them, and they all have their own kind of history and their own story, and their own, and there's a, a separate uh, belief about each one of them in terms of whether they are important for sacred reasons or whether they're important for utilitarian reasons. But the Blackfeet see all of them as important. People still go and use them. The Blackfeet still go and use them, even though they're not on the reservation anymore. And, um, and when they can, the Blackfeet tribe does try to use their own sort of political um, power to try and attempt to manage um, development of the Sweetgrass Hills. So far, uh, I think the entire state of Montana has been lucky that there hasn't been um, more uh, aggressive forms of development and gold mining because there is gold there, and there has been gold mining in the past in the Sweetgrass Hills, that it hasn't turned into something like the Little Rockies. So. Way in the back. No, not you. Sorry. <laughs> um, this is a question for you, Mosey. What would your, I guess ideally, what would management of Glacier National Park and the what would it look like? Well, it would, I mean, uh, uh, me personally, or, well, I mean, I, I would argue that the tribe, so not me personally, that I, th I would say the tribe would be interested in some sort of system where they could do some kind of co-management. Perhaps not of Glacier Park, but of Badger 2 Medicine. Glacier Park, because now it is a national park and it falls under, again, a completely different system of federal uh, laws and regulations. Um, there's no worry for a lot of, you know, man, uh, uh, there's not any worry about um, exploitation, um, about how it's being used, you know, in terms of like mining or anything like that. Um, I know because of the Blackfeet do have treaty rights in those areas, that they would actually like their treaty rights to be upheld. That's not going to happen anytime soon. It Because the federal government won't allow it. Um, having that happen in the Badger II medicine, for the most part, you can exercise your treaty rights because it's a different system. It's national forest land versus national park land. So. Um a couple of different perspectives on whether people would would want to have the tribe just kind of take over management of those particular areas and there are some different opinions on that so I was wondering what well first of all the federal it, in terms of management the federal government would ha there'd have to be some sort of agreement because it is federal land right not tribal land 
I think it could be ideal. I mean, I think, of, of course, the Salish and Kootenai are a prime example that they do have a wilderness area that they do manage, and it is possible for a tribe to do it and be successful at it. So it's not that there are no uh, models of success that exist there. Um, That's a great question. I believe on the tribe's website you can access the Mission Mountain Mountains Tribal Wilderness Buffer Zone Management Plan. But uh, but basically um, there's some flexibility. You you can't take merchantable timber, but there's a but there are provisions to do hazard fuel reduction because it's in the wildland urban interface. So um, the um, management of the of the buffer zone is um, it's really a desire to um, minimize um, further intrusion of roads. Uh, and not only have have we um, established uh, provisions for um, for management of the buffer zone, but we've really worked with um, the county government, the um, you know those other um, governances with that um, are within the reservation to try and, and get cooperation and, and management as well. Uh, the whole the whole buffer zone management plan is is really quite complex, and I I'd love to give you more information about it. Y you know, there's some information here. I forgot to bring door prizes. <laughs> so one more question, way up there. Um, thank you both for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, and my question has to do with non-tribal members who visit these areas that are sacred. And how can we do so respectfully when we don't necessarily know in particular areas. What advice do you, what you give to non-tribal members so that we can be respectful in these places? I, I may pass it on. I, one, I don't know. <laughs> I think it's, it's difficult because um, there are some sacred sites that are on the reservation, obviously, and the tribe can kind of control access. There are some that are in Glacier Park that um, the tribe really has no control over the access. Um, I know myself personally, I've, I've, you know, in other places around the world, when people say, this is our sacred temple, you know, I'm right in there, like every American, taking pictures of myself, standing on top of it. <laughs> okay, then. <laughs> You are not coming with me. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, I think that's a really great question, and I, I think that um, that is the challenge. Um, there's incredible misunderstanding and miscommunication across cultures. I mean, Rosalind and I can sit here. We speak to you in English. We wear Western clothing, but we've been raised in a culture that provides us a different cultural lens. I mean, when my father said said things like, don't bother that, implicit in that message was that that, um, that place, that resource had intrinsic value of its own and that it was not appropriate for me to, um, as a child, to um, to bother it, so um, that's an in incredible challenge, and and um, there's an escalating challenge. Um, the more um, um, I don't know how to say this, but it, you know, in in sacred sites where there is a presence that um, should not be disturbed, that there is um, escalating valence in terms of 
non-disturbance. So, and, and to compound that, the additional challenge is that that's, we would never minimize or trivialize the importance or the sacredness of that particular place by speaking about it casually, by throwing that information around or talking about it out of the cultural context or the ceremonial context in, in which that, um, the practice at that place is, um, is spoken about. So um, I guess, um, you know, I, for us, what we have also done is created the South Fork of the Jocko Primitive Area, and that's an area that has uh, very unique cultural and spiritual values, and, and that's close to non-tribal members. Um, and we ask people to respect that closure because that's that's a place where um, you know it's it's it just would not be wise to in, invite anybody or everybody. So um, you know we try and provide some some boundaries and some some parameters, but um, it's a little bit of a dicey area. I mean, it, I I don't know how to answer that well. I, I'm passing it back to Roz and she'll be. <laughs> No, I, I think Jermaine's right. It's very challenging. And um, it's one of those things where I, I think it depends on your own personal belief system. It depends on, you know, there's places I personally would not go to because of the belief system I was raised with. But, so for example, I would not climb to the top of Chief Mountain. I wouldn't really go near Chief Mountain, physically near. Um, but I know a lot of people do. A lot of people do hike to the top of Chief Mountain. A lot of people do go there. Um, and it's challenging for, so it's a, it's a challenging question. And I don't know what the answer is. I know what I would not do. But again, like I said, if I, I've desecrated many a sacred site. That was not my own. So. Yes. <laughs> so. Um, Thank you so much for coming. Great questions. And we don't want to keep you later, but thanks again. I have one yep. more case study for anybody that would like it. <laughs> I, I want to thank you.